of state, St. Nicholas Standard Dockwood, represents a medieval legend woven into the historical event of the Council of Nicaea. This first paragraph is the read a simple history. This isn't the legend. Uh, quote, in AD 325, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea, the very first ecumenical council. More than 300 bishops came from all over the Christian world to debate the nature of the Holy Trinity. It was one of the early church's most intense theological questions. Arius from Egypt was teaching that Jesus the Son was not equal to God the Father. Close quote for a second, because now we start to stray for what is definitely known to what someone else thinks happened. Arius forcefully argued his position at length. The bishops listened respectfully. As Arius vigorously continued, Nicholas became more and more agitated. Finally, he could no longer bear what he believed was the central being attacked. The outraged Nicholas got up, crossed the room, and slapped Arius across the face. The bishops were shocked. It was unbelievable that a bishop would lose control and be so hot-headed in such a solemn assembly. They brought Nicholas to Constantine. Constantine said, even though it was illegal for anyone to strike another in his presence, in this case, the bishops themselves must determine the punishment. The bishops stripped Nicholas of his bishop's garments, chained him, and threw him into jail. That would keep Nicholas away from the meeting. When the council ended, a final decision would be made about his future. Nicholas was ashamed and prayed for forgiveness, though he did not waver in his grief. During the night, Jesus and Mary, his mother, appeared, asking, Why are you in jail? Because of my love for you, Nicholas replied. Jesus then gave the book of the Gospels to Nicholas. Mary gave him an amaphorium, which is a bishop's vestment, so Nicholas would again be dressed as a bishop. And now at peace, Nicholas studied the scriptures for the rest of the night. When the jailer came in the morning, he found the chains loose on the floor, and Nicholas dressed in bishop's robes, quietly reading the scriptures. When Constantine was told of this, the emperor asked that Nicholas be free. Nicholas was then fully reinstated as the Bishop of Myra. The Council of Nicaea agreed with Nicholas's views, deciding the question against Arius. The work of the Council produced the Nicene Creed, which to this day many Christians repeat weekly, but I stand to say that we believe. Close quote, end of that story. And that last part is true. If you're in a Catholic church, you're much more likely to say the Nicene Creed than you are the Apostles' Creed, and if you want the Nicene Creed, it's in the back of our hands. It is technically possible that St. Nicholas was present at the council. He was a bishop at that time, and there were over 300 bishops there, but John and St. Nicholas is not listed as an attendee. There is no reference to this story before medieval times. Since the story, if true, doesn't seem like something earlier writers would just kind of forget to mention, it's widely believed to be legend, perhaps told to lift up St. Nicholas as a defender of the humanity of Jesus at a time when Christians were finally getting around to celebrating Christmas more widely. The first celebration of Christmas we know of didn't come until about 10 years after the Council of Nicaea took place, and only really caught on in the 9th century. And so a few centuries later, we get this, this story emerges about St. Nicholas. But the kernel of truth in both the legend and the Christmas threat 
is the Arius, who was a priest called to the council for the examination of its teaching and not a bishop there by invitation, did pose a threat to the understanding of who Jesus was. His ideas were gaining traction with others in the church, which resulted in the conflicts. Such conflicts have been going on amongst Jesus' followers pretty much since the morning of the resurrection. And different factions within Christianity rose up around different ideas across time. We saw that when we looked at the Gnostics a few weeks ago. But in those earlier centuries, theological differences within the church posed no threat to the government. Beyond the inherent threat of both Christians and Jews refusing to recognize kings as either emperors or gods, was the answer. Heresy was a religious concern and not a political one. The Roman Empire under Constantine changed that equation. When Constantine converted to Christianity in the year 312, he made that personal conversion into a mandate for the empire. Constantine didn't believe that he himself was a god, but since he believed that being Christian would ensure the success of his military actions and conquests, Christianity could no longer be a choice for the empire. It had to be the official religion for everyone. If you remember, Constantine didn't come to Christianity after a long time of study and examination. He had a dream and a Christian woman, and he became convinced his conversion could secure his power as the emperor of Rome. I said this before, but when political and military power is tied to a religion, any religion, it naturally leads to pressure to conform to only one single expression of that religion. If beliefs are allowed to get too diverse, enforcement of a single narrative becomes impossible, and power structures then have to diversify in response. That diversification is very, very good for democratic governments. But it's really problematic for kings, for emperors, who keep their positions by at least speaking for God, if not claiming to actually be God. They dictate what people can and can't believe and practice according to what best helps them stay in power, adding threats of divine retribution rather than just political repercussions for coloring outside the strict religious lines. Fear of God is stoked by state-sponsored religious violence. In our day and time, do not sleep on that information. So Constantine adopted a religion he did not understand, saw conflicting beliefs within it, and saw a threat to his empire if he didn't get that conflict sorted out to come to one thing that all Christians believe. At the time, the teaching the bishops were most upset by was being spread by a priest named Arius. So Constantine told the bishops, so all 300 plus of them, that they had better get themselves into the room and sort that all out. Constantine's power. And now that he is a Christian empire, their power as bishops as well depended on it. So they gathered in the city of Nicaea in modern Turkey and sent an engraved invitation to Arius to be in attendance to defend his views. My take is that they were all in over their heads on this one. So don't be discouraged if you don't have trouble trying to follow the arguments. But here's the debate. Largely based on the first chapter of John's Gospel that Kim read earlier, and we hear every Christmas, and with little to no support from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Christians by the fourth century had come to believe that Jesus was not just the Messiah expected by Jews, and not just the divine being 
that she informed but that Jesus was fully God in the flesh, fully human and fully God at the same time. And that's still Christian teaching today. The problem is, as soon as you say that from a pulpit, as the early church priests and bishops found out, somebody is going to ask you, say, how's that possible? And that question will then lead to others that are still asked today. Well, if Jesus was God, then who was he praying to? Then others are going to bring up all the Son of God language in the Bible, not to mention the passage in both Mark and Luke, where a man addresses Jesus as good teacher, and Jesus says, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. And if Jesus actually is God, and then ascends and sits at God's right hand, what's that about? Are they using mirrors? And what's this only begotten son thing? Is God having babies now? I don't get it. All those questions come out when you just say, you know what, Jesus is fully God and fully human at the same time. So priests getting those questions did one of two things. They either went to their bishops and said, Bishop, would you please tell me how to explain this to my father? Or they came up with the answers themselves. Both are problematic, which I'll talk about in a minute, but Arius was in the latter category. The answer Arius gave was that only God was eternal, but that at some point before the creation of the world, God created Jesus as a kind of self-expression, which became known in philosophy as the Logos, the Word of God. That Logos then served as a mediator for the creation of the world, and finally became flesh in the world of Mary through the Holy Spirit to be physically born in the person of Jesus. Now that's still a pretty mild idea. But it's a thoughtful and I think still a respectful way to try to put together all the issues about Jesus taught by the church and represented in the Bible because they don't necessarily match. And it was satisfying the curiosity of lots of people who were asking the questions, including other priests who found it a better answer than they were getting from most of their bishops. But the bishops, we're having none. To be fully God, Jesus had to be co-eternal with God and Father. There were other teachings around that Jesus was made along with creation, and we've already seen that some of the Gnostics believed Jesus was totally human until the dove descended at his baptism, and then the spirit exited at following by hands I can make the spirit. And the bishops stomped all those things out too, to the extent they could. But Arius teaching that Jesus was created but before time, before the creation of the world, was close enough to their own that it was harder to refute, and it caused a bigger rift. To set things right, with the exception of two bishops, the Council of Nicaea condemned Arius, and Constantine produced this edict about his writings. In addition, if any writing composed by Arius should be found, it should be handed over to the flames, so that not only would the wickedness of his teaching be obliterated, but nothing would be left even to remind anyone of him. And I hear all make the public order that if someone should be discovered to have hidden a writing composed by Arius, and not to have immediately brought it forward and destroyed by fire, his penalty shall be death. As soon as he is discovered in this offense, he shall be submitted to capital punishment. Those who hear is too clear, let them hear. Arius himself was not executed, just exiled and excommunicated. Although my synod in Jerusalem said they would actually restore Arius to full communion. And a new emperor ordered Bishop Alexander of Constantinople 
to receive areas into that communion, Bishop Alexander earnestly prayed that areas might die before that permission. Areas did die shortly thereafter in a very public and sudden hemorrhage that killed him almost instantly, which some believe was a poisoning and others believe was a judgment of God for his heresy. But, if Arius was so very wrong, how did the bishops of Nicaea explain the correct view? The Council of Nicaea produced the Nicaean Creed explicitly to wipe out the Arian heresy and all variations on his theme. It's about twice the length of the Apostles' Creed, which we used earlier in the service. The Apostles' Creed came together across many centuries beginning with some very early sources and representing a consensus of Christians across time. But the Nicene Creed is a direct shot at Arius, created by the Council for that purpose, and is at its most direct in the beginning of the Jesus section of the Creed. It reads, We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. Maybe I'm just this, but if you're resorting to words like consubstantial, I think you've already lost the war. For me, those words of the Nicene Creed cleaned up exactly nothing. They're very pointed on the begotten part. Jesus is definitely begotten, that's in their trumps. But they insist that is definitely not saying made. It's begotten, not made. Well, there's an all lot of pain. Here's the thing. There is absolutely no way for either Father Arius or any of the good bishops of the Council of Messia, including St. Nicholas, if he was indeed present, to know the facts of any of those things. Pontificating about what God did or didn't do before the creation of time is interesting to consider, but it is ultimately unknowable in this life. All of the various positions about how Jesus is or isn't connected to God have Bible passages to back them up. The mechanics of putting them all together is not provable at all by any means. It's a matter of faith. What both the bishops and the Arius were trying to do I think was the same fool's errand as the six blind men trying to describe an elephant from the Indian folk tale I shared at the start of this series. Let me remind you of the final stanza of the brilliant poem of John Matthew Sachs, giving the moral of that story. So oft in theologic wars, the discretents I need rail on in utter ignorance of what each other need. And prate about an elephant, not one of them has seen. That is how I view almost every council of the Catholic Church. As they move further and further out of the lane of human knowing to pray about an elephant that not one of them has seen. Doing that isn't necessary, or to my mind, useful. Figuring out how to apply what the Bible tells us directly and clearly that God is love, we are made in that image, and Jesus is what that divine nature looks like when we perfectly in human form, is plenty for us to work with for a lifetime, and I think is all we need. To go further is not only unnecessary, it can lead to great harm. Killing people for believing something that's impossible to prove is a gross abuse of power. 
which is why matters of faith should never, ever become matters of civil law. And insisting that Jesus must be described as being in some way begotten of God. And they use the word incarnate for what happens with Mary. Begotten is a special term for this before time. To insist on that begotten language has inspired wars and interfaith animosity that continues to this day. Jews and Muslims had a very hard time believing that this time, largely because of the language developed in those councils, praying about the unseen elephant. Because Muslims recoil at the literal notion of God begetting the sun, countless lives have been lost to crusades and wars and acts of terror, despite the fact that Muslims view Jesus as a prophet. They believe he was born of Mary, and that Mary was a virgin. Mary has an entire chapter in the Quran named for her. Muslims affirm many of Jesus' miracles, and believe that Jesus will come again to restore justice on earth and dispatch the Antichrist. We actually agree on a lot. And yet, here we are, hating each other and spilling blood, in large part because Christians can't admit Paul's claim in 1 Corinthians 13 that our earthly knowledge is only partial and will remain so until we come face to face with God after the protesting. Believing that Jesus and God are one is something that I find useful to my life in many ways. That belief ensures that I see Jesus' teaching as the way God wants me to live in the world. Believing that Jesus is God gives me a stronger basis for making decisions on close calls and a clear, although by the way it's easy, path to follow. It would be too easy for me to make excuses for my behavior if I believe Jesus was only human or was some kind of self deity but does getting clear on whether Jesus is co-eternal with God or instead created by God before the beginning of time make any difference in whether or not you offer food to those who are hungry? Does it stop wars? Will it help a legislator decide to protect clean water or preserve wildlife? Will it help us welcome the foreigner as a citizen among us as Leviticus commands God's people to do? Will it help us to better love our neighbors or to bear witness to God's love through our lives? When Jesus talks about having identified false prophets, we might substitute the word heretic here in Matthew 7, his answer doesn't involve words like not substantial. He's direct and to the point. You will know them by their fruits. Boom. And Jesus is just as direct when people come to ask him how do they inherit eternal life. To the Pharisee in Luke 10, the answer is to love God and his neighbor as himself. That's the answer that kicks off the parable about the good Samaritan as the guy wants to treat the definition of neighbor. The start of Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler in Matthew, Mark, and Luke also begins with the young man asking how to inherit eternal life. Jesus' answer is to follow the commandments. He tells his disciples in John 13 that people will know that they are his disciples by their love. Those things are the fruit that separate true belief from false and are how I have come to judge the doctrines of the church. How does believing X, Y, or Z affect my fruit? And does that same belief produce the same fruit in others? The distinction between begotten and made is barely comprehensible to me. So it really doesn't have any impact on my behavior. 
But I do know that Arius used his belief to help his flock, while the begotten, not made believers and people likely included Arius nerd. But maybe the begotten, not made distinction wasn't the belief producing the good or rotten fruit. Maybe the desire to silence or kill those who believe differently comes from somewhere else. We'll keep looking for the culprit across the next few weeks. Amen.